thanks so much for being here. I'm Lorenzo Francesco Bicchirai. I'm a staff writer at Motherboard. Um, and just a little bit about me before we begin. Uh, I've been covering InfoSec for around six years. Uh, you may remember my uh, weird interview with uh, Guccifer 2. By the way, it's pronounced Guccifer 2. I know it's controversial, but um, let's set it up. Uh, let's settle that for once and for all. And uh, despite loving InfoSec, I also do love pizza, and uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, so this talk would have really been called a few different ways. Uh, one of them would be attribution ain't that hard. Uh, he, even skids can slip malware on the Google Play Store. And pizza, spaghetti, and spyware. Luckily, I think we have enough time to cover all these um, angles today. So before we begin, just a quick uh, note to uh, define the terms and make sure that we're all on the same page. So uh, for the purpose of, of this talk, government malware is, in my view, malicious software that collects data from computers and more, more commonly now cell phones for uh, police, law enforcement, and intelligence agencies. Uh, this is also sometimes called uh, spyware, government Trojan. Uh, in Germany, it's called the Bundestrojaner. In Italy, has, uh, it's called Tro Trojan di Stato. Uh, what these are are basically remote access Trojans, uh, rats, implants. Uh, what is lawful intercept? Uh, the lawful intercept industry is um, made by companies that do contract work for police, intelligence agencies, uh, mostly making the implants. Uh, some of them also develop the exploits. Think of NSO Group. But usually the, the companies specialize in implants mostly. Uh, so what we're talking about here is uh, companies like Hacking Team, Finn Fisher, and all that good stuff. Um, and finally, uh, more of a, a note. Uh, even though I'm not uh, in, uh, in the intelligence world, even though I've been accused of being a CIA spy by someone in this industry, uh, I do have sources and methods that I have to uh, protect as well. Uh, mostly I have to protect my sources. Um, so today we're going to talk about how um, uh, me and a group of uh, people, um, Ricardo, a colleague from Vice Italy, and uh, Claudio Guarnieri from uh, Security Without Borders, a great nonprofit that does work uh, helping dissidents and human rights activists stay secure, how we discovered a rare Android malware called Exodus. Uh, I believe this was really one of the first in-depth investigations into how local law enforcement in Europe uses spyware uh, within their own borders. Uh, we're used to see a lot of great research on um, this kind of spyware um, used in like uh, the Middle East or South America, sold by these companies. But in this case, uh, the company was based in Italy and, and used the malware in Italy. Um, this is also a great uh, case study for the collaboration between security researchers and journalists. And here I mean that uh, since the very beginning, both uh, us at Motherboard and Security Without Borders, we worked together to uh, unravel this mystery uh, since day one. So this is not a case where a security company comes to us with a report already made, an investigation uh, completely finished, and, and asks us to, to cover it. And um, this investigation was basically done on two tracks, if you will. Uh, on one side, the journalist, me and Ricardo, uh, did interviews, did FOIA work, uh, some investigative work. So basically use journalist tools. Uh, and on the other side, Security Without Borders did the reverse engineering and the malware analysis. And what's interesting is that we, the two um, tracks fed on each other and we helped each other like, find out what was going on here. So how did, we, how did we get to, how did this all start? And everything began uh, last year when um, Vice Italy published this article. Uh, that revealed that the Italian police uh, was able to compel um, cell phone providers and telephone providers into sending text messages um, to fish targets that were under investigation. The text messages were usually um, fake maintenance messages, uh, service requests to like update settings on the phone, basically bait to get the targets to install malware. Um, that this, if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense, right? In the, in the good old days, if you were the police, you could just go to the service provider, um, get a warrant first, obviously, hopefully, 
go to a service provider and then uh, get the data. So either like you know intercept phone calls, text messages, um, and that's all you needed to do. But once end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, became really popular, um, this didn't really work anymore. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of uh, wiretapping going on at the backbone level, but as more people use stuff like WhatsApp, um, governments will need to use malware to get that data. Um, and we got here really uh, because in the early 2000s, uh, apps like Skype and BlackBerry Messenger popularized end-to-end -end encryption um, and really turned the cards on the cops, right? And we wouldn't... I, I, I do think that this was a, a landmark, landmark moment in the development of the lawful intercept industry. And this is also how we got to this point where we have uh, inc incredibly popular apps like Signal and WhatsApp, which is installed by 1.5 billion people in the world. Um, and all these apps, again, are out of reach for the cops with traditional surveillance methods. So after the article that I was talking earlier, uh, a few months later, I started hearing rumors of a new company from the south of Italy, from this region called Calabria, uh, that apparently was doing very well um, in the spyware market. But no one really knew who they were. It was kind of mysterious. And it was kind of surprising because Calabria is mostly known for uh, these wonderful beaches and uh, something that is called nduia, uh, a really delicious so spicy sausage that I highly recommend. Uh, at the same time, a few weeks later, uh, Security Without Borders found uh, a bunch of suspicious apps on the Google Play Store. And that's when we started talking together and decided that uh, there was something here to look into. The apps that the, they found all looked like this. Uh, you know, this has uh, special offers, um, apps that help uh, supposedly optimize the service on your phone, uh, more offers uh, helping, and apps that help uh, unlock the SIM card. All things that looked more or less um, harm, harmless, but uh, there was actually more to it. So at this point, the, re the really big questions were, is this malware, is this just I don't know, crap, crapware, if you will. Is this how the Italian cops uh, fish targets like we saw before? Or is it just like criminals, like, you know, doing some crypto, crypto mining and kind of boring stuff like that? Uh, the bigger questions were obviously who makes these apps uh, and who are the victims? Who, is, who, who has installed these apps? But the even bigger question was at this point, what is the story? And is there even a story here, right? Because we, we've seen a lot of malware on, on Google Play. This is not really a new thing. Um, criminals have, have put malware on there. Uh, you know, Google has done an amazing work uh, hardening devices like the Pixel, uh, which are, at this point are almost at the same level as the iPhone in terms of security. But Google Play is really, I believe, still kind of a weak spot uh, in the whole chain. And it is possible to uh, get malware on it. Um, the really hard challenge here, though, was that we had no information on the victims. Um, so the way that these investigations usually start is that um, a victim, like think about uh, Ahmed Mansour, for example, in the UAE a couple of years ago, when he got that phishing message, um, he sent it to Citizen Lab, and they, that's how it started. In this case, we had the apps, and we had no idea who the victims were, which made it very hard. Uh, but we set out to uh, see what we can find, and the mission was to find cyber gold. I have no idea if this is a good movie, but I rec I'm curious about it. So what's, let's talk about the malware. Um, as I said, there were 25 malicious apps on Google Play. Uh, they were all uploaded between 2016 and 2019 at different times. Obviously, they were taken down um, after a while. And uh, when we contacted, um, when both us and Security Without Borders uh, talked to Google, Google told us that um, this was all malware and that uh, there were like less than a thousand victims and they were all in Italy, which made it very interesting. Like um, usually you see um, this kind of spyware pop up all around the world. This seemed like a pretty targeted and locally, um, and a local uh, operation. The, the malware was pretty simple in terms of how it worked. Uh, there were two stages. 
Um, obviously, I'm not a malware researcher, but I'll do my best to sum up the amazing work from Claudio and the Security Without Borders team. Uh, the stage one was a dropper that collected uh, only two things, uh, the IMEI, the unique ID for the, tele the cell phone, and the cell phone number. Um, the function of, in the code was called check valid target, which clearly indicated that the stage one was programmed to make sure that the person installing the apps was actually someone under investigation, right? The target of a lawful um, police operation. The problem, however, is that when Security Without Borders installed the app and tested it on a, on a burner Android device, they saw that the, the malware essentially went straight from stage one to stage two. So the check, uh, the check was essentially not enforced. And stage two was essentially malware, right? A rat. Um, it got downloaded and it executed a payload and yeah, it's a rat. So the rat was what you would expect in this kind of operations, right? They, it, it allowed the operators to see all the apps installed on the phone, uh, record the, like turn on the microphone surreptitiously and record the audio, uh, get call logs, uh, record phone calls, take pictures, uh, get Facebook contacts, um, you know, exfiltrate data from all these popular apps like Telegram, WhatsApp, Viber, all you can think of. Obviously get geolocation, Wi-Fi passwords, everything you can think of. Uh, but there was, other than the stage one and stage two issue, there was another problem, another a couple of problems with the malware. The first one was that the Exodus opened a, a remote reverse shell uh, to the command and control server with no TLS, no web encryption, which allowed like anyone on the wire to sniff in the, on the data and perform like a man in the middle attack. Um, which is obviously something you don't want in this kind of operations. Uh, you may be able to see this is the reverse shell. Um, and the other issue was that the malware also opened a bunch of ports on the device that allowed anyone on the same network, like imagine the same Wi-Fi, to um, get root on the phone and tamper with the data. So the risk here was clearly was that someone could um, remove data, um, tamper with the evidence, and you know, if you're like a police agent working on a case, you don't only have to get the data first, but you need to like uh, preserve it and be able to then later uh, tell the court how you got it and make sure that, you know, prove that no one has touched it. Here's the, the open ports. So at this point we knew that the malware was not that sophisticated, but as, as we've seen in, in the history of the lawful intercept um, industry, you don't, need, you don't need fancy malware. Um, Sometimes crappy malware is all you need. Although in this case, the problems were pretty critical. At the same time, a couple of weeks after we published our story, uh, which was limited on Android malware, uh, Lookout, the security firm, also found uh, an iOS version. It's not clear if this was a, a test or sort of like something still in development, uh, but the company that was making Exodus was working also on an iOS implant, which makes sense, right? You may want to, you may have to spy on some uh, iOS users. Um, this malware was even less sophisticated than the Android version, however. Uh, first of all, it required the users to accept enterprise certificates. Um, so not only the user, it was basically like a double phishing um, operation. You needed the user to install the certificate and then get them to install the app. Uh, which presumably makes it pretty hard uh, for it to be successful. Also, this malware really had limited um, access to the device, right? iOS is pretty hard to exploit, and this was very basic. All it got was contacts, some audio recordings, photos, and not much more. We, we then tried to figure out something about the victims. This was definitely, as I said, the, the harder part of the investigation, and it became later sort of the key of the scandal that we'll talk about later. Um, uh, we, not only we have no idea, we had no idea who the victims were, but we didn't even know how they got their, the malware on their phones. Um, you know, presumably it was phishing, but we had no, uh, you know, no phishing messages, no phishing emails. Um, it could have been through physical access, it could have been through all days, we just didn't know. 
but then through what I guess you would call human intelligence, we found a source that um, told us that the operators of the malware were using it against uh, what the source described as guinea pigs, uh, essentially innocent people. And uh, court documents later revealed that this was the case, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So on the, on the legal side, there was also, this, this presented a bunch of issues. First of all, according to Italian law, uh, putting malware on Google Play is probably not legal. Uh, and the idea there is simply that if you put the malware on Google Play, it's possible that anyone could download it and get infected. Um, moreover, as, as I explained earlier, the vulnerabilities in the malware uh, put the investigations at risk. We, we, we tracked down a police agent in Italy um, who reviewed the research essentially and told us that uh, this was not uh, how it's supposed to work. Um, he was actually pretty shocked that this was something that um, the police was using. At that point, we had to figure out who was behind the malware. Um, and as you, might have, as you may have heard uh, even this week, or you know, this happens almost all the time, uh, people in the threat intelligence industry say attribution is hard. It's almost become a meme. Uh, in my view, it has almost no meaning. Uh, but yes, attribution is hard, uh, but it's possible. You can do it, and uh, you don't have to be the NSA or GCHQ to do it. Uh, obviously, if you are GCHQ or NSA, you have a much better telemetry that I will ever have, um, or Security Without Borders will ever have. Um, but the, the problem that NSA and GCHQ and people like that face is that they don't want to reveal the fact that they know who did, um, this, you know, who made the malware and who hacked uh, um, the devices. Um, this was captured pretty well in this great talk uh, and paper by Brian Bartholomew and, and Juan Andres Guerrero Sade. And uh, the gist of it is that um, you, you don't have to, you can't really reveal um, who, uh, sometimes you can't reveal who, who the hackers are. Um, and the other, the other issue with attribution is that, uh, as the source once told me, there's no attribution without retribution. And this means that even if, like, what is the point of even um, accusing someone of hacking if you cannot do anything about it, right? Like, as a journalist, I cannot do anything about uh, someone hacking into a device. If you're a government, on the other hand, you can. Um, you know, we've seen the FBI indicting Chinese and Russian hackers. Uh, you know, you could use the attribution in uh, diplomatic talks and stuff like that. Uh, so those guys really can do something about it. But as I said, attribution can be done, and in this case, uh, we did it. And I, I think that it's okay for journalists to do attribution. Obviously, we have to do it responsibly. We have to make sure that, you know, we're not pointing the finger in the wrong direction. Um, we have to weigh the public interest in revealing who is behind a, uh, a certain operation. But at the end of the day, the who did it is a key answer. Uh, it's a key question that needs to be answered in journalism. And uh, the who did it, um, we really began to answer it thanks to some um, breadcrumbs that we found in the malware. This was the first, um, the first evidence that we found that pointed in a certain direction. If, uh, on the left side, you see this, world, uh, this word, munditsa which is a, a dialectal, it's a dialect from the south, specifically from Calabria, uh, that means garbage. And here on the, on the right side, you see spelled out the name Rino Gattuso, which uh, I don't know if you follow soccer, but uh, Rino Gattuso is a soccer player um, from uh, last decade that was very popular and also from Calabria, like the word Mundiza. The real, uh, so to speak, smoking gun, however, was this server, uh, CNC, that we found in uh, some of the apps. It looks pretty innocuous, but it was actually uh, pointing the malware to the, to the, the operator's servers. Um, one of the keys here is that the CNC server was self-signed uh, with a TLS cert, um, and uh, Security Without Borders uh, wrote it, developed a fingerprint for the cert, and uh, searched for it on census.io. And this allowed them to find uh, other servers linked to the same um, company. And also all the servers shared the same favicon, which was another 
uh, interesting and sort of uh, novel way to attribute the malware. As I, um, Security Without Borders searched on uh, Shodan uh, for this favicon, which honestly I didn't know was even possible, and uh, found 40 servers. All these servers were linked to eServe, a company in uh, Calabria that publicly and officially was only developing um, camera surveillance um, and the back end to manage the camera surveillance. On their website, there was no indication that they were also making malware. As you can see here, these are some of the other servers we found. Uh, the logo is right there. I mean, this is almost too easy, right? Um, here's the short and search uh, with some of the servers we were able to identify. And another breadcrumb was LinkedIn. Uh, thank God for LinkedIn. It's always um, a source of amazing uh, uh, evidence. Um, we found an employee of eServe that um, essentially admitted to being a malware developer, right? On, on his resume, he said that he developed, quote, an agent application to gather data from Android devices and send it to a CNC server. This is a fancy way to say, I write malware. Uh, we also, the, we got a source that told us that, yes, effectively, eServe was developing malware, and they called it Exodus. And the name Exodus also came, um, we, had, we had, at that point, we already knew or suspected the name, because in some of the CNC servers, uh, we found this, this word. And lastly, the, the final, uh, I guess, uh, point was that um, we were able to FOIA and find um, an Italian government document that revealed that eServe had a 300,000 euros contract with the state police in Italy to develop passive and active interception system. So we knew who did it. And just to sum it up, at this point, uh, we knew that eServe was making uh, spyware. We knew it was called Exodus. We knew they had a contract with the cops. Uh, we knew there, were, there had been at least 25 apps. Uh, we knew that there were like less than 1,000 uh, targets and victims. Again, we still had no idea about the targets, and this was really uh, a problem. Uh, because at this point, uh, we were pretty much ready to publish, uh, but the discussions among us became um, what happens when we publish, right? Uh, even though we had sources telling us that some of the victims were vic um, innocent, Presumably, a majority of, of the targets were actually lawful, legal um, targets. So if this was used by the police, we can, we can imagine that, you know, maybe it was uh, uh, drug investigations, uh, perhaps um, organized crime. So we, we really had to stop one second and think, um, what do we do? Like, do we, do we mention uh, the name of the company? Uh, do we uh, show screenshots uh, of the apps? because you know, that could have maybe alerted um, like an, a mob boss that they were being spied on. Um, so we, we were very aware and sort of concerned about the risk of putting legitimate um, investigations at risk. And even though Google told us that the apps had been taken down, it was possible that similar apps were still um, out there. So we decided to take an extra step and really make sure that um, we were not uh, screwing anybody up. So we reached out to the company, which obviously we would have done to get their comment. And this was a strange uh, interaction. Initially, uh, they acted very surprised. I remember a phone call in which they were like, wait, what, malware? Us? No, that's impossible. Um, then they stopped answering essentially to our calls and emails. They ghosted us, as you would say. And interestingly, uh, after we first contacted them, they took down the website which was suspicious. We also contacted the police, uh, a bunch of prosecutor's offices. Here we were sort of um, shooting blind, if you will, because we had no idea exactly who was using it in terms of uh, uh, prosecutor's offices. Again, we had, we had no answer. And finally, we also uh, reached out to the Italian government through an intermediary, essentially saying, okay, guys, we are going live soon. This is what we know, let us know if we're putting anybody in danger here. And again, we only found silence. So it was time to go live. 
And this is where the story gets pretty weird. Um, I've been writing about this for a few years, and honestly, I, um, it's really hard to predict how stories will do, the interest that they will raise uh, among the, um, the public. And I sort of expected this to not really hit. I thought that, you know, um, we've seen a lot of spyware makers, especially in Italy, it seems like it's almost like a, a national uh, hobby to make malware. Um, you know, we all heard about Hacking Team, um, uh, but there's, many, there's been many more. There's been Aria, there's been NAG, uh, which was revealed a couple of years ago by Kaspersky. Uh, there's been RCS Lab, GR Systemi, Roxir. It's almost like I, I can't even keep track of them anymore. And uh, at this point, I was like, who cares? There's another one. Who cares? But at, at, as it turns out, people cared. And uh, as soon as we published uh, Exodus, the Exodus investigation became a huge story in Italy, uh, probably more than any story that hacking related to hacking team, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, what, what captured the imagination of the Italian public was obviously the fact that there were guinea pigs, uh, there were innocent victims that had been spied on. So the headline became, you know, a thousand innocent Italians have been spied on, which was factually inaccurate. Uh, but, you know, I guess good to get attention. Um, and the story really was, this could have happened to you. Like, this could have been your neighbor, your friend, anyone could have been spied on. And what, what, when things really turned weird was that when we found out, when local news reports revealed that two prosecutor's offices were actually looking into the company, the spyware maker, um, and they, opened, they, they actually had opened the investigation before uh, we ran our stories. And the investigation was because um, the operators of the malware, uh, eServe, um, were illegally monitoring innocence, according to the, to the authorities. And uh, the authorities found that uh, employees were even listening in to phone calls and uh, reading text messages in the office, sort of as a lunch break um, hobby, I guess. Um, and we and they were calling the victims, uh, the innocent victims, volunteers, which is an interesting way to describe innocent people. Um, the other issue that we had no idea before, but we found out once the news hit, was that um, eServe had sent uh, empty servers to the prosecutors. So the way it should work in Italy, and I presume that it, that's how it works in many other countries, is that when you use this kind of spyware, you get the malware, you get the implants, and then, um, as a police um, agent, you get the data on your own servers within the premises of your like um, police office or prosecutor's office, because obviously the goal there is to make sure that no one uh, does what eServe allegedly was doing. But in this case, uh, actually the whole case, the whole investigation started when a police agent uh, was performing a routine uh, check of some um, wiretap for an investigation. Uh, there was some malfunction in the, um, on, on his computer. And he decided to go downstairs to the server room and realized that the servers were empty. There were just metal boxes sitting there for no reason. So it, Italian law uh, says that the wiretapping servers need to be on government premises. eServe used AWS, AWS server, servers, which I guess everyone does it, but you know, this is a kind of a different business. Uh, also, another issue was that another issue was that uh, prosecutors in one office could read um, investigations and data from any other office. So, if you were working in Rome, for example, you could read um, the wiretap data from uh, Naples or Sicily. There was no so no like limits on what kind of data you could access. And the result of all this is that uh, the CEO and CTO of eServe are now under house arrest and under cr uh, criminal investigation for illegal wiretapping and some other uh, crimes. Uh, the authorities estimate that uh, around 200 of the 800 targets were unauthorized, so again, innocence. We don't know who they are still, and uh, most importantly, we don't know why they were targeted and how they were chosen even. Um, so yeah, the authorities are looking into it. The Italian Data Protection Authority, which is sort of like the FCC or the FTC, I guess, of Italy, uh, publicly called out um, this investigation. 
uh, called for better safeguards and um, a better regulation of government trojans. <clears throat> so how did, how, did, uh, how did we get here? Um, how did we get to this point where we have um, a small company like this uh, that can do this kind of uh, damage? Uh, and to really understand how we got here, we have to look at the history of lawful intercept. And in the last decade, this history has been pretty well documented, right? Um, you know, we've all read uh, the, citizen, the amazing Citizen Lab reports on uh, companies like NSO Group. Uh, there's been uh, dozens of reports from AV companies and threat intelligence companies. Um, in the early 2000s, we even saw leaked documents uh, published by WikiLeaks on these companies. But the 2000s and 1990s, on the other hand, are not very well documented. Uh, but that is not because Lawful Intercept did not exist. It's just that no one was really paying attention and no one knew about it. Um, but at that point, they were already, governments were already using malware and hacking um, to get this data. And we know this because there's some anecdotal evidence of it. Um, for example, I know of a developer that, again, on LinkedIn, thank God for LinkedIn, uh, he says that uh, he's been working on Windows malware for more than 20 years, so since the late 90s. Um, I also know of a case in 2002 when um, a hacker that was working for the police in Europe uh, downloaded a $40 uh, rat off the internet uh, as part of a terrorist uh, investigation. And, you know, back then, that's all you needed. Uh, there were no contractors. Uh, the security of the devices being targeted was uh, much lower. So you could just go online, go on some shitty forum maybe, and get a rat. And also, uh, in the last decade, or the previous decade, uh, as some of you may, uh, may have noticed, uh, there was an uptick in uh, government employees coming to Black Hat and DEF CON, uh, not only to learn of new techniques and uh, sort of like, you know, learn about the cybersecurity industry, but also to recruit and uh, get new tools. Um, in the U.S., uh, we have more, uh, more data and more, uh, we know more about the history of lawful intercept in the U.S. Uh, the earliest mention, I think, was uh, around 1998, when we found out about the, the FBI's network surveillance system called Carnivore. Uh, pretty funny name, I have to say. In 1999, uh, we found out about the FBI uh, using malware. In this case, it was a simple keylogger uh, to steal a PGP private key. Uh, this was a pretty interesting case where uh, a mob boss in Philadelphia was using PGP to communicate with his associates. Um, those were the days of PGP. Um, and later on, uh, we also found out about the Magic, uh, magic Lantern malware. Um, in 2003, we learned about Operation Troll Mix, uh, another operation where FBI used spyware, in this case against an animal welfare group. In 2007, the FBI used malware um, to trace some bomb threats, which is interesting because if, if the FBI was using malware in this kind of cases, uh, you have to wonder how many we don't know about, uh, how many more critical cases we have never heard of. Meanwhile, in Europe, uh, it's, in Europe is where the lawful, indus industry, lawful intercept industry was really born. In 2003, uh, Hacking Team is founded in Milan, and there's a little bit of a myth uh, that Hacking Team at the beginning was not really a spyware company, that they were sort of like a pen testing consulting services, and that is not totally true. Um, they were, I think their mission was making spyware since day one, and, and the, um, the proof of that is that their first recorded sale outside of Italy was in 2004. Uh, this is when um, uh, Al-Qaeda bombed the uh, a bunch of um, trains in Spain, um, and uh, the legend goes that after the terrorist attack, the intelligence agency in Spain called up hacking team and said, hey, we need your malware. And, uh, and I think, I don't know if this was, a, I don't know if hacking team was the first one to realize that they could sell these uh, tools outside of their own country. Uh, it could have been Finn Fisher, but this is really when uh, the market went global. But for many years, we had no idea about it. No one had heard about it outside of the industry. Until 2011, when WikiLeaks published documents uh, from hacking team. I believe it was a brochure. And that's when the world realized that this was going on. At the same time, this is also the Arab Spring, uh, when uh, activists in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and other countries 
um, you know, protested the, um, the regimes there. And, and, and the activists in Egypt, for example, stormed uh, the security services of Egypt and found a bunch of documents pertaining to FinFisher, uh, which is a company from Germany and the UK that also makes spyware. And from then on, Hacking Team and FinFisher really took over the market. Um, I, it's, it's really hard to tell who was uh, the first, and uh, if you ask them, probably they will tell, especially Hacking Team, uh, they, would, they will tell you that they were the first. Um, but really, they were, they were just the first ones to see the, the business, they, the, the first one to see that this was a market, that there was a demand for these kind of tools. At their, at its, um, on, on, the, on its best days, Hacking Team was present in around 41 countries. Uh, this is before the uh, famous 2015 breach by Phineas Fisher. Um, Finn Fisher um, reached 32 countries. Uh, this is based on research by Citizen Lab. So we don't really know exactly if those, that's the total uh, because when Finn Fisher was also breached, um, we, they didn't, the hackers did not get um, spreadsheets detailing the the customers. Here you can see a map uh, showing the um, sort of the foot footprint of um, Hacking Team and FinFisher. Um, you, in orange, you have uh, countries that had both FinFisher and Hacking Team. In red, Hacking Team, and in yellow, FinFisher. So you can see that they they really went everywhere. And, the, and the other interesting thing is that some countries like uh, Mexico, or UAE, or Ethiopia. Um, bought from both, both companies. And so again, this is like early 2010s. Um, and and what we, where we're now is that NSO Group, a uh, company from Israel that you may have heard about even this week, uh, has really taken over the market. Um, it's, it's, it's unclear, it's hard to tell why uh, they've been able to take over. Uh, it's possible that the, the breaches against Hacking Team and Finn Fisher hurt them, but a more reasonable explanation, I think, is that NSO Group is really on a whole another level compared to those two companies. I mean, just to give you an idea, Hacking Team was never bigger than 40, 45 people. And of those, like, a dozen of those were, like, salespeople. Uh, so in terms of devs, they really had, like, a small team of, like, eight, ten people. So that's, you know, it's pretty impressive to, like, reach so many countries with such a small team. Uh, on the other hand, NSO is huge. Um, we're talking about around 600 employees. Uh, I think uh, more than 100 of them is R&D, so people developing the exploits and the implants. Um, according to data from investors, NSO is present in uh, 35, around 35 countries with six, 60 or more customers. And they made $251 million in 2018. This is like, and this is where NSO operates um, according to research, again, research by Citizen Lab that tracked them through uh, DNS cache, uh, cache probing. Uh, obviously, NSO has, has not confirmed these co countries, um, but it's, it's a fair bet that this is more or less where NSO operates right now. So where is the lawful intercept market today? Uh, according to Moody's and S&P, it's worth $12 billion, and it's only going to go up and getting bigger uh, because you know more people use cell phones, more people use end-to-end -end encryption, and despite the calls for encryption backdoors, uh, I don't think we're going to go back to the golden days of easy wiretaps. And um, as, as I mentioned before, a lot of countries have bought from different companies. Um, it's unclear why. Uh, I think we can speculate that sometimes you may need uh, uh, plausible deniability, maybe in some cases you want, uh, you know, some companies make better mobile versions of the malware, some companies are better at desktop, um, and you know, the budgets, government budgets are pretty good, especially in the West, um, so you have money to buy all these kind of products. In, uh, in the U US and China are interesting, um, interesting markets, and they, they don't work as uh, the same way that the rest of the world. Uh, so if you're in the Five Eyes and you develop this kind of malware, um, you usually only work with local companies. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. So in Five Eyes, for those of you who don't know, it's like US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. So if you're a company like, say, Azimuth Security, 
you, you only want to deal with those governments um, for various reasons. Um, first of all, they're the ones that have the better budgets, but also they're the ones that don't want to even have to worry about uh, their tools getting used in the UAE and burned that way by uh, careless customers. In China, the situation is similar. Um, it's hard to tell. There's really very little research on it. But we know that China is moving towards um, a reality where all offensive capabilities are kept within China. It, it's kind of a balkanization of offensive uh, capabilities. Italy, on the other hand, is an interesting case study within Europe. Um, and to understand the Italian market, you really have to understand that um, authorities love wiretapping. Uh, it's called intercettazioni in Italian, and especially against organized crime, this is often uh, the key to solve these kind of uh, investigations. And it's, it's really a cultural um, phenomenon. Like even as a kid, I remember growing up and uh, hearing news about uh, leaked um, inter in wiretaps uh, showing up on the news uh, from you know, po politicians talking on the phone and stuff like that. It's really ingrained in the culture. And the other interesting aspect of Italy is that there's really no, like the, the way the market works is that every, almost every prosecutor's office has a lot of leeway and freedom to get their own uh, tools. Um, there's no, almost no like centralized uh, pipeline for these kind of tools. And this has created a market where if you're a small startup in a city like Milan or the south of Italy, you can really reach uh, your own local offices uh, just by virtue of being there and maybe having connections with the, the police. So again, the result is a fra fragmented market with a lot of uh, companies, a lot of boutique uh, companies that provide these services. Uh, in the past, we had like a network level interception like ARIA, RCS, and uh, more recently, malware makers like Hacking Team, NEG, and now eServe. Just to give you an idea of the Italian market, uh, luckily, we have some data from the Ministry of Justice. In 2017, uh, there, ha there have been 106,000 phone wiretaps. Uh, these are the um, good, o good old traditional uh, wiretaps on the wire uh, made by ISPs. Um, so, you know, no encryption. And uh, there's also been 16,000 wiretaps done uh, with bugs. And what I mean bugs is not, here is not vulnerabilities. It's more like, um, you know, physical uh, interception devices put under a table or in a car to spy on uh, suspected criminals. And what we really care about today and what we're talking about today is wiretaps done through electronic uh, surveillance. Uh, we think that this is malware, but the um, the data from the Ministry of Justice is not as detailed, doesn't really spell out malware. Um, of these, uh, there were 4,500 in one year. And uh, also we know that there's at least 140, 150 licensed companies in Italy, uh, companies that can sell these kind of capabilities to the government. This is a chart that shows you um, the number of electronic uh, wiretaps in the country. So I, I think that we're, we're at the point uh, where lawful intercept is here to stay. Obviously, there's a lot of debates and controversy around uh, stuff like the Wassenaar Agreement, uh, which mm, aims to regulate uh, how companies in the West can export malware to other countries. Uh, but what this investigation was about is how governments use these tools within their own um, confines. And the reason I believe lawful intercept is not going to go away is that end-to-end -end encryption is not going to go away, right? Uh, the DOJ can call for um, backdoors as much as they want, and uh, you know, we, you may have heard about the Australian law uh, that's very controversial about backdoors as well, but this is not going to stop encryption. Um, it, and this means that there will only be more and more NSOs and hacking teams uh, ready to provide services to governments all around the world. The real challenges at this point uh, become to figure out who are the com companies that provide these services, and most importantly, who are the people behind them and how you vet them to prevent uh, something like this. How do you make sure that 
the companies that make this malware do not become themselves the spies and sort of like uh, amateur police agents. And uh, again, thank you very much to Security Without Borders for their help in this investigation. I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, so thank you, Claudio. And thanks to Riccardo Coluccini, my colleague from Vice Italy. And yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, I think we have... Thank you.